very much. It's, it is a pleasure to be here um, and to help celebrate 160 years of the Nova Scotia Institute of Science. Um, so does it look like everything? You can see me online and it's all good. Um, yeah, um, I guess I would just uh, like to, to start uh, this talk and, and uh, make it in memory of Ian Holt Jones, uh, who I've had the pleasure to meet uh, and you'll, you'll hear about him, uh, but he uh, just recently passed away. So we've fortunately lost Ian, uh, but um, I'd also like to uh, encourage those in the audience and, and those online um, to take a minute and maybe hold your phone up to the screen and this QR code should open up a website where if you're not a member of the NSIS in this 160th year, maybe you could join uh, students. It's only $10 um, and regular members are 30. I'm waiting for someone in the audience to test this out. To pull up their phone. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see if we can break the server out. How many members can we get tonight with this, this talk? Okay, I got a, got a few phones going here. Maybe there's some online. Smash, okay. Success. All right. Yeah, so we'll come back to that. Um, uh, I actually became a life member this year. Uh, Nova Scotia Institute of Science has uh, been a part, and part of my career and, and uh, encourage everyone to, to support this uh, important uh, society. And I'm going to talk about um, some history of uh, science in Nova Scotia um, because the mastodons are do play a really important role in this. Um, so we'll be talking about several ways the Nova Scotia Institute of Science has contributed to the, our understanding of mastodons, but also um, uh, how the Nova Scotia Museum has contributed, obviously, with the collections. And both of these uh, institutions, Nova Scotia Museum and the Nova Scotia Institute of Science, have their roots in the Halifax Mechanics Institute that formed around 1830 until around and was active until around 1860. And it was located in Dalhousie College. Uh, so that's the first iteration of Dalhousie University. And that building you see on the left that's Dalhousie College isn't the current campus but that would be the location of where City Hall is today on the Grand Parade. So that's where uh, I'll be, when I talk about people visiting the Halifax Mechanics Institute Museum, that's where they were going, that Grand Parade area. The first museum, the Provincial Museum, uh, was located in the building that's now a sort of associated, well, is associated with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. That was, the, the first provincial museum in Nova Scotia was on the top floor, and the first curator was David Honeyman, who you'll hear about. So there was the second uh, building was on Spring Garden, uh, is now the architecture school. And if you look around the, the facade of that building, you'll see names like Kelvin, but also Dawson uh, and other scientists of Nova Scotia. So if you haven't noticed that, take a look at that building next time you're uh, downtown. And now uh, the Museum of Natural History is located on Summer Street, but the Nova Scotia Museum is also 28 sites located all around Nova Scotia. So we'll come back to this history. Um, you're here to hear about mastodons, and <coughs> the Museum of Natural History does have a really nice exhibit uh, on now, um, the age of the mastodon. Um, and that name is maybe a bit prophetic now with the all the social movement, social media change that's undergoing. But um, the age of the Mastodon uh, focuses on uh, particular specimens that were collected in 1992. It features a uh, full life-size replica cast that was uh, purchased by the museum, uh, exhibits that show the teeth that were found all over Nova Scotia. Uh, I put several week, months into putting the, some of these bones together and they're now on display. So the humerus and the, the scapula uh, shown in the, the cabinet there. And also uh, other displays that talk about um, the, the various other animals that were found in this sinkhole that was um, in, located in the gypsum quarry at Milford uh, and National Gypsum Quarry in Milford. Um, so mastodons, if you don't know, just a very brief, this isn't good, this 
we're not going to talk a lot about the intricacies, but I, just so you know what we're talking about, we're talking about an elephant-like animal, is proboscian. So American mastodon uh, was a bit smaller than the mammoth, um, but basically a hairy elephant. Um, and they lived uh, across North America for uh, the past uh, couple million years. And um, you tell the difference between a mastodon and a mammoth mainly from their teeth. There, there are differences in their tusk and in the anatomy of the skull and general features of the limb bones, but those are quite subtle. But when you see the two teeth, it's very, very different. Uh, the teeth of a, a mastodon are very, uh, have strong knobs that come together and are very good for crushing things like branches and spruce boughs and spruce cones, very hard things. Whereas mammoths look more like two fists that rub together and they're good for processing grasses, right? for grinding, yeah. And the mammoth tooth is very similar to the elephant tooth, and they are actually more closely related. Mastodons, which we're talking about tonight, are an older branch of that family. So there was several pulses out of, North, out of Africa where proboscians uh, came across the, the, um, uh, into North America through that Northern Bridge. And so those several pulses and the American mastodon, the mastodon was one of those early branches. So there's just a, a, another way of depicting that to show um, that the mastodon branch goes back a bit further and that the mammoth is more closely related to the, the uh, living elephants we have today. Uh, as a paleontologist, all we, I have to, we have to work with are the bones, and they're, they're massive things. They're really fun to work with because they're so big. Um, but do keep in mind that these mastodons have these trunks, just like elephants today, and, and such an important part of their lifestyle and, and habitat and, and social interactions. They're, they were very, you know, elephants are a very social, social animal. Um, so unfortunately, we, we, no, I don't have the ability to study the trunk, so it's important to keep that in mind. Mastodons did have uh, a fur or hair covering their body, uh, which, is, which is good in the winter. So the age of the mastodon exhibit, which is on at the Museum of Natural History in Halifax, uh, I think until around February, and then there are plans that it will tour um, uh, or, uh, to a couple locations in the province, so keep your eye out for it if you're not here in Halifax. It, it, focuses on a dig that happened in 1992. Here's a photo of Bob Grantham from the newspaper uh, just after the find um, was made. Uh, the image on the left is Kelly Cazera, who uh, was the other uh, major person involved in this dig. So Kelly Cazera worked uh, as a museum scientist along with Bob Grantham, who was then curator of geology. The two of them spent uh, basically about eight months solid, recovering the, working through uh, the mud and recovering the bones of this mastodon, as well as a rich uh, record of turtles, frogs, and birds, and spruce cones, and branches, and logs, and beaver chewed wood, and uh, previous other sites have found beaver bones. Um, so the gypsum that you see on either side, that white uh, edge of the, the photo, uh, is being mined at Milford, and they're coming up to this really thick, dark, black mud, which was the mud that filled in this sinkhole 80,000 years ago. So this is 1992, um, uh, made international news. It took them a long time. Here's a photo now that they've worked their way down through this mud. Uh, you see them working meticulously and carefully to remove the, as much of the mud as possible. I don't know if I can get my mouse to work. Sorry if it doesn't show up online. But sure, no. Okay, so uh, here's the top of the skull with some vertebra. The scapula that I was showing you in that case is down here. And the, there's a femur located up here. Um, so they've worked down through about five, four or five meters of mud to get to this bone bearing layer. Um, and uh, really an amazing uh, project that they did. So after it was all collected, it took about a year or two to uh, carefully dry out the bones and consolidate them. And 
They've been in museum storage. They've been studied a little bit by scientists, but they've been basically in storage until this exhibit, uh, which opened in, um, uh, when was that, March? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so we announced in October as the 30th anniversary of the, the dig that happened. So it's been 30 years that these bones have been collected and in the museum, and now they're on public display. Just another diagram to help. I'm not gonna to get too deep into geology, but it is kind of, I think, important for you to think about. Uh, the gypsum layer is this white layer with the little crosses. And gypsum is uh, a mineral that formed when an ancient ocean evaporated. And all of the minerals that are dissolved in an ocean, just as, it, as the water evaporated, they got richer and richer and richer and eventually formed these beds of gypsum and or limestone, but mainly gypsum. Because it formed from water, it easily dissolves in water. So the, the challenging thing of living in Nova Scotia is that there's a risk of sinkholes. The Oxford sinkhole a couple of years ago is a, probably the most uh, recent example, really dramatic thing, rapid formation of this deep hole that everything just disappears into. And that forms because water is flowing through the gypsum and the water table, forming tunnels and caves and caverns. And as it comes to the surface, near the surface, the, the top surface ground can just fail and sink down into these tunnels and get washed away. So over on the, the right is the a river flowing by. And when you have a lot of water flowing by and rain coming down, I love that term, <coughs> Schlottenkaren. Karst's term, a geology kern, that's, that's the really pointed uh, cone-like shapes that you might see. So when you see that, that <coughs> landscape has been uh, exposed and, uh, to a lot of water, but also has been that way for, for quite a while. Um, the image on the left is an example of a modern sinkhole that, you know, the Oxford sinkhole. That's what the formation looks like. The one on the left, is an ancient sinkhole where the mastodon was found that's 80,000 years old. And you see the top layer has been flattened by the glacier coming across and grinding it away. So that sinkhole on the left was filled just like the Oxford one 80,000 years ago. And then the glacier came and scraped off the top. So why sinkholes are important, especially in Nova Scotia, is that if we didn't have those sinkholes, the mastodons wouldn't be preserved. They would just be ground away. All of their remains would be lost for oblivion. Um, so these sinkholes that the mastodons are found in were, were preserved on the other side that were from before the last glacier, this interglacial period in between glaciers. So about 400,000 years ago, or over the past 400,000 years, we've had about three or four pulses of glaciers, not glacier, glacier, not glacier. So the glacier, interglacial periods would be similar to what we're living in today. Warm summers, cold winters with snow. And that's what the mastodon was living in. Living in uh, warm summers, cold winters. Mastodons didn't live with the glaciers, because the glaciers were a kilometer or two kilometers of ice thick above us. There was nothing other than this glacier moving across the landscape and grinding things away. The Macedons lived in these interglacial periods. You can kind of slide it up a bit. <laughs> Somehow magically. Uh, just zooming in um, to explain how we know the age of the mastodons, because if you date wood or bone with radiocarbon, it'll only go back around 40, uh, 45,000 years, and you, the carbon doesn't, you know, it maxes out. You don't know anything beyond that. So, uh, Here. Oh, so 
Um, it was a Dalhousie researcher, Dr. Uh, Dorothy Godfrey Smith, um, did a couple different aging studies. So studying the sediment with thermal luminescence and came up with an age of 135,000 years. And then looking at the, one of the teeth that was found uh, with electron spin rhythms found at the age of around 75,000 years. So that's why we think that animal was 85, 80, around 80,000 years old. Um, what I'm really excited about is we also have a karst sinkhole-like fill from the Cretaceous that's 135,000 years old. It was found in Windsor. Some of the oldest pine fossils in the world are found there. And so what that tells me is when we find a sinkhole, it could be 80,000 years old, but it could be a million years old, could be 2 million years old, could be 40 million years old. So I'm really, really excited now about sinkholes. They're these natural archives that could give us these glimpses into this, uh, the window of what Nova Scotia was like during these periods. And it's really from this big dig in 1992 that we now understand a lot more about the value of these sinkholes. That I told you there was turtles, birds, and all kinds of things preserved there. There was also a mastodon dung. So as the animal slipped or fell into the sinkhole, was getting uh, trying struggling to get out, it did poop, <laughs> and that poop became a fossil copper light. Um, um, uh, the mass on dung was preserved. And you, when you look at it, you can see the, the sticks and all of the things are still in there. It is a little bit solidified. There is a little bit of mineralization that happened. So Scott Cocker at Alberta uh, asked for a sample. We gave him a sample uh, about three or four years ago. He's since published that in um, the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. Does it show up on Zoom? It does not. Okay. Yeah, so Scott's done an amazing project with this, taking the sample, dissolved it down, um, and looked at the different elements. And, and you know, do check out that, uh, that article that in the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. Um, so in that sample, he was able to get really well-preserved, delicate, preservations of seed pods and little casings from all different grasses and sedges and uh, uh, different types of seeds. Also the carapaces of these insects, delicate little things. Uh, the head of an ant, number 15 there. Um, so, or uh, an ant or something chewy like that. <laughs> I'm a vertebrate family, I'm just not an insect guy. But just trying to make the point of what amazing preservation this dung sample has. And he did do a Quirks and Quarks episode from this paper. He's an excellent communicator. Um, so what this does is it records that animal's last meal. You can imagine it walking through the spruce woods that we have here up in Cape Breton or anywhere, you know, around Milford area. It's chomping at the spruce boughs, and there happens to be some insects in there. And nope, that was unfortunate. It goes down in the stomach. And then he happened to slide into the sinkhole after he was maybe getting a, trying to get a drink. And that sinkhole then released and buried him uh, quickly. Um, so amazing preservation. And that's just some of the, 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 the science that it is covered in this exhibit, uh, Age of the Mastodon. So do really encourage you to go and, you know, you can see the impressive size of this animal and the bones and, um, and think about all the work that has gone into this study and these artifacts that are yours. The Nova Scotia Museum collection belongs to the province. Um, scientists have this great opportunity to study them, but they, they really are our treasures. Um, so I am wanting to talk a little bit about drawing in science. I do uh, try to advocate this as much as possible. Um, uh, I do have visual art training, but I also have science training, and I don't really discern them too differently. Um, I try to point out that scientists draw, and they, they, they do drawings for their 
their science. And it's important that we try to keep encouraging students today to draw, to observe, to mark, because uh, you see better by drawing. So that little drawing there is just me sitting in the museum uh, enjoying that exhibit. So an example of drawing would be field notes or field maps. So here's the dig that you saw. I'm working away, carefully trying to expose these bones before they're removed. And as they're working away, everyone has a field book, field uh, log that you're, you're recording your observations in. You're making handwritten notes, but you're also making little drawings and diagrams. And so this diagram drawing on the right is the initial quarry map for the Milford Quarry site. So there is the skull that's shown there. These are the vertebra, five vertebra all in a row. There's a scapula, there's the femur, there's some ribs. So it doesn't need to be a Michelangelo, but making those marks and putting them in relation to each other is really important for trying to understand not only where they went when they're removed, but you're building that mental picture of what, what you're working on. So you might expect, you might then predict what, you're, what you might expect when you're working in another area, because you can start to see how the animals laid out. So thanks to Bob Grantham for, for sharing this uh, drawing from his field book, uh, the original book that's still at the museum. Um, so then from that original sketch, a, a more formal and detailed field map is worked out. Again, at the bottom now is the skull, the five vertebra, the scapula with that really prominent process, the ribs scattered around that femur on the left-hand side of the wall. He's shown, this is a really amazing map that he's made. He's, he's actually got depth measured. So it's an, it's an X, Y, but it's, he also is recording depth of how things, where they are. Uh, so each of those bones has a number, but it also has a depth position uh, that he's measured downwards. Him and Kelly uh, did that. So what's exciting now is they also amazingly took stereo pair photographs. So the younger folks have no idea what I'm talking about, but everyone else in the room knows what a stereo pair is. It's the original 3D where you'd have these stereo pair glasses and you have two copies of a slide and you put them in front of your your eyes and you actually see a 3D image. And so the way um, Bob Grantham did that, he would take a photo and he would just move a small little distance and take another photo. And he did that many, many times. <coughs> and what's amazing now is you can scan those slides and put them into photogametry software and photogametry is fine with that and it'll create a 3D model. It'll reconstruct that 3D space using these 35 millimeter slides. So super innovative for Bob to go through that process, the, the challenge of taking those, um, those slides. But what we can now do, and this is another little neat thing, I would really encourage you, if you wanna draw the Mastodon, like I did in the gallery, but you can't get to Halifax, just Google University of Michigan Mastodon, and you can get a 3D model that you can move around and zoom into uh, on, your, on your computer and, and do your drawing. But they've been very generous and they've provided the museum with a copy of that 3D model. This was a skeleton that was collected, uh, I think around 2000, it's called the Bushing Mastodon, and they digitized all of the bones that were collected. It's an incredible model, it's an incredible thing to have as a scientist. I found it very, very helpful in looking at the models as I was putting these pieces together. But what's amazing now is you can take this map that Bob Grantham created and the model that University of Michigan has provided and the orange bones are basically showing the ones, the major ones that we have of the adult from that sinkhole in 1992. And you can just break the skeleton down and just put them where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So that's level one. That's about the first demo of me trying to use this process and then trying to put the whole skeleton. If I didn't see it in the quarry, like the hip was found by the excavator, so that moves out of, the, out of frame. 
that this is where the top of the skull is, those five vertebrae, the ribs, the scapula, the humerus, the femur. That's where they all were. So that's generally how the skeleton fell apart or moved into the sinkhole itself. So that's just using the layout of the map. Now these stereo pairs that Bob Grantham took, this is just a demo of two of them. He's now, they basically finished the dig, the quarry is empty, and he's just moving around taking some detailed photos. That's where this 3D model comes from. Now the Buching model is also being a sort of sinking down into the sinkhole where it should be. So now, 2022, we're going to have these models and in, in, on my computer, I can move around and we can play around with different things of maybe the leg moved over here or over there. And we can start taking Bob's original sketch in his field book where he's mapping things and trying to understand how the skeleton was laid out. Now we can really start playing around with things and seeing how that sinkhole was being um, moved. Uh, and that top of the skull is another example of a stereo pair where Bob Grantham has done two and we've actually got a 3D model that's made. So maybe just one more quick look at that. So you can note that that's a 3D model down there where the skull is. So Kelly Kazera, Bob Grantham put a huge amount of work into this, uh, working on behalf of the museum, on behalf of all of us to you know, preserve, collect and preserve these specimens. All from their notes, everything has a number, everything was carefully labeled, stored properly. That's our heritage, our science heritage that they've provided us. The other neat thing with that sinkhole was they were working through, as I said, three or four meters of mud and finding stuff all the way along. And it gets kind of stressful because you know what you're going for, but you're working <coughs> through all this stuff. So Ruth Whitehead, the uh, curator of ethnology at the time at the museum said, well, why don't you ship out boxes to the schools? So they did, they sent out, they took these carefully mapped out sections of the mud as they worked through and sent out 300 boxes to schools all across Nova Scotia in 1992. Sorry for the folks in the room. This is the, the heading says Picto uh, school students working through the Mastodon mud. And there was news coverage uh, all over the place of, of this. Uh, in providing the box full of mud, there was also a data sheet that was provided to all the schools. So this one was returned with the samples. This was the school, um, the one from Dartmouth High School. This is Dr. John uh, Martyrs, uh, sorry, Mosier's class. Don't have my glasses. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, this is sample 366. You can see we've also got another drawing there, letting the students know what they're working on. Um, and there was a key, but they also asked the students to draw out what they found and label things. So here's a jawbone with four teeth. There was also a possible bone, a thin bone, all these little bones and little, one looks like a tooth or a claw. So these samples then came back to the museum. The museum sorted through some of them and some of those bones were then sent off to, to other people to look at, so other experts. So one of them, one of these samples went to Alfonso uh, Royo, as how would I pronounce his name? So he wrote, literally wrote the book on uh, uh, fish osteology. And what does he do? He did a drawing. This is sample 366. This is the same jaw with four teeth. He's done a more detailed drawing showing, you know, the structures around it and stippled it carefully. There's a scale bar. And he also provided a copy from his book of what he's looking at. So again, drawing is important to science from the data collection to the analysis to the publication and sharing of that. Drawing is important, being able to see and draw uh, what you're looking at, very important. So this was a great learning experience for students. 
and very helpful for the museum because we were able to sort through all these 300 boxes of stuff. Um, and some really amazing things were found by them. Another thing that I've been doing is uh, trying to promote uh, more open uh, activity of drawing in the museum. So trying to think about how do we engage specimens with artists or scientists who want to draw. So this is an example of a session we did just before the show opened. So that's Tom Forstall and uh, a couple others from uh, NASCAD coming in to, uh, to draw some bones. And I reached out to Tom Forstall specifically because I saw in their field book, Bob's field book, special uh, guest arrived at the dig today and drew some bones. Tom Forstall was here. So I, I met Tom Forstall, I contacted him, hoping he still had those drawings um, and I didn't see them, but this is one that he drew after 30 years has gone by. This is the humerus of the adult. So drawing, uh, I think is really important in science. This isn't a Nova Scotia project, but this is something I learned about and, and, and learned and came in touch with through the exhibit. So Dr. Bernard Means at um, Virginia Commonwealth <coughs> University worked on this comic with the artist and very creative uh, Maggie Colangelo. Uh, so working together, merging history of mastodons in North America. So talking about Benjamin Franklin and the early history and Maggie's extreme talent of developing narrative imagery and stories. They have this uh, comic that you can download for free. It, they published it on their the university website as an open source thing. So founding monsters, that QR code will take you right there and you can download it and read that comic. And they also have a second um, uh, founding monsters tale. So about the making of that comic. So not only do I try to encourage uh, science students to draw and understand the power of drawing, get artists to draw, but I'm really interested in trying to translate science, history of science into this graphic novel format. I think it has a real strong power. So that's the age of the mastodon, that's the drawing in science uh, that I hope provides context. Now we're gonna get back to this history and everyone's gonna fall asleep. <laughs> this is, I think, really you know, interesting stuff and may make a great comic someday. Um, so this is talking about the first discoveries of mastodons in Nova Scotia. Uh, I really want this thing to go away or go down below. Go down there, see if that helps. So the first record that we have of that Mastodon in of Mastodons in Nova Scotia goes back to 1836, and it's the Dalhousie or at Dalhousie College, the Halifax Mechanics Institute minutes, November 2nd, 1836. The minutes, you know, we just had a Nova Scotia Institute of Science meeting, and there was a you know, there's minutes taken. So this is the minutes from that meeting, handwritten. The, the ledger is still at the Nova Scotia archives. Says John Young, Esquire lectured on the advantages and pleasures of science. Um, I don't know a lot about John Young, uh, but uh, a little bit that I do know, he wrote a lot about uh, agriculture, <coughs> and science of agriculture under the pen name Agricola. So that's what Agricola Street's named after is John Young. So um, November 2nd, 1836, the following presents were also exhibited to the Institute, a bone of a mammoth found in Cape Breton, presented by, and there's a blank. But if you look also in the Nova Scotia archives, the newspaper uh, from Saturday, so that meeting was on Wednesday, but the uh, newspaper says the Mechanics Institute opened last evening on Wednesday with excellent introductory paper from John Young, Esquire, Dr. Gesner, is to lecture on the coal fields of the province next Wednesday evening. Several valuable presents were exhibited to the uh, audience, a thigh bone of an immense animal supposed to be a mammoth found in Cape Breton and sent by Peter Clark, Clark Hall, Esquire. This will form a curious and valuable addition to the museum and then also a model of the Avon Bridge uh, forwarded by uh, Mr. Warren, the engineer. That's about to die. So that's the first published record of this 
large bone found in Cape Breton uh, in 18, brought to Halifax in 1836. It was actually found in 1834. Not science, but kind of a curious little thing. It is a museum, so people are going to check it out. And it turns out that um, Jackie Molson, so the soon to be heir of the Molson Brewery, uh, the 14 year old was stuck in Halifax because his ship was getting repaired, the Britannia. Um, and so he went to the museum in a stone building built of free, this is from his diary, a stone building uh, built of freestone contains several curiosities consist consisting of beasts, birds, fishes, insects, and all other animals stuffed. There's a large bone which was found in Prince Edward Island, about four feet long and weighing about 200 weight, supposed to be a thigh bone of a large animal that existed before America was discovered. Why it was, why he thought it was from Prince Edward Island, I'm not sure, but maybe there was labeling things, I, I'm not sure. But he certainly saw it, wait, killing time, waiting for his ship. He just walked up to the Grand Parade area popped into the museum and noted that in his diary. <clears throat> Just a couple months later, uh, two other really important people went to the museum, Charles and Mary Lyell. Um, we know from uh, Charles Lyell in his travels to North America says on July 31st, the 11th day of their voyage, they have been in Boston and they're uh, or maybe they're on their way to Boston and they were moving from Boston to from Liverpool. On the 11th day of the voyage, we sailed directly into Halifax Harbor, which by its low hills of granite and slate covered with birch and spruce reminded me of a Norwegian fjord. Uh, I landed here for six hours with my wife, who is also a geologist and a conchologist, a scientist in her own right. Um, six years with my wife, during which we had time to drive about town and see the museum where I was shown a large fossil tree filled with sandstone, recently sent from strata containing coal in the interior. I resolved to examine these before returning to England as they appeared by the description given to us to afford the finest examples yet known of the world of petrified trees occurring in their natural and erect position. The mastodon femur was there, but he liked the tree. <laughs> he maybe leaned on it even while he was looking at the tree. But that set up his return trip that next year in July and August of 1842. He and Mary came and spent a month traveling around Nova Scotia. And that's really a, an important moment in Nova Scotia geology. Doesn't mention the femur, but it would have been in the room, quite certainly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it would be another 30 or 40 years before we have a visual record, a drawing of that femur. And it was published by uh, J.W. Dawson Acadia in Acadian Geology. The image was produced in his second edition in 1868. So there's the large bone of what they thought was a mammoth, what we now know is a mastodon. So that's the first record. I think you can hide it. Ah, people at home have no idea what I'm doing. But so that's the first record of this large bone, four feet long, published in Dawson in 1868. I just re-looked at the writing. He, and he actually was sent a photograph by David Honeyman of that, which I found mind-blowing that I hadn't realized that before. Anyway, this is a drawing that Dawson did of the bone for publication. It would be another hundred years, mid-1960, the bone was sent to Ottawa for carbon, radiocarbon dating, and we have the first really high quality photo of the bone. A hundred years it took. Maybe it was done beforehand, but we have, I have no record of it. Um, and then another, 60 years when I've had the bone re-photographed again, but I've also drawn it. And I want to put that out there because I'm now drawing it not for Dawson's 
depiction of what it looked like, but I'm drawing it to show those areas that have that stipple mark. Those are erosive surfaces, call them taphonomy of a bone. Bone is moved through the sediment or down a river and been abraded after it was released from its tomb, right? So I'm studying those surfaces to, to figure out what happened to the bone afterwards. Um, so drawing is, is really important. Of course, we still use also modern technology. So here's the bone in 2018 at the VG. Uh, after hours, there is a, a research facility for CT. Um, and, you know, we get a, a really high quality 3D model and we can see through it. This is just a, a rolling view, but, you know, you can see all the way through it. And I'm, I did this because you can see how cracked it is. It has those vertical cracks and it's had those cracks since Dawson's time. But as we put it back out on display, we wanted to study its internal structure to see, just make sure it was uh, up to uh, being put on exhibit again. So lots of technology still put at it. So we know it was found in Cape Breton. Um, Dawson mentioned that a little bit too. Um, so here's a map from 1829. This is Thomas Halliburton. I'm gonna just zoom in to Cape Breton. Because this is the this is the era of the femur. That's why I'm showing you this. But I also want to note that Thomas Halliburton in the history of Nova Scotia, there is a section there that talks about the geology and says, this is before the femur was found. Uh, remains of vast animals are found, which it would appear formerly ranged in the vicinity of Bordeaux. Enormous bones resembling thigh bones six feet in length are reported to have been seen lying at the bottom of the lake. Then in 1834, a farmer was plowing his field, Alexander McRae, known locally as Big Sandy, plowing his field, hay field, hit something, dug it up, and it was this bone uh, of a beast. Uh, that's from Middle River, found in 1834, and two years later came to the Halifax Mechanics Institute. I'm just superimposing here the geology map of what we know of the bedrock geology of that area. You see it, those both those arrows are pointing to light blue. It's going to be Windsor Group. I'm going to come back to that. They wouldn't have known that at the point that time. That's just foreshadowing. So Dawson first figured it, but he also figured this other thing, a tooth. This is 1868. And he describes, uh, Dawson described that the tooth was acquired by David Honeyman, who would become the first curator of the museum. And Honeyman wrote about finding or getting that tooth was given to him by Dr. Kerr, or sorry, Reverend Kerr. Reverend John Kerr is a Presbyterian minister in PEI. Um, he secured the specimen, Kerr did, and delivered it from the hands of those who did not appreciate its value. It is said to have been in good preservation when found, but the blacksmith's hammer and vice had broken a part of the end ridge and the enamel had broken off. Only about one half now remains. The enamel is jet black on the outside and white within. Um, it seems to have been partially worn off the ridges during the lifetime of the owner. Um, and Dr. Kerr gave the tooth to Honeyman. Probably in 1857, Reverend Kerr died in 1859 or 1858. He had a diamond jubilee in 1857 that Honeyman as a Presbyterian minister probably went to. Honeyman was just getting into uh, um, science himself, into geology. He had just read, um, J.W. Dawson's Acadian Geology first edition in 1855, and he basically, in his mind, left the ministry and went on to study geology, wrote his first paper on the fossils of Arisag uh, in 1859. So this tooth, given to him by a friend from PEI, um, was really important. It then, and it, it is still in the museum collection. So from uh, handed down from, from Kerr. And 
it was that tooth that went to the 1862 uh, London Exhibition. That's the view of what represented Nova Scotia in 1862 in London. About 3 million people saw that display, saw that moose, saw those curling stones, the gold fields display, and that tooth in amongst the displays, millions of people. That's the same year that <coughs> Nova Scotia Institute of Science formed, 1862, 160 years ago. So I almost didn't put this in, but I wanted to put this in. Why was the tooth, why, where the tooth count came from Bedeck? How did it get to PEI? Kerr said it came from Bedeck. How did he get it in PEI? I think this is the answer. I'm still trying to nail, get the final nail of evidence in this historic research, but it relates to Abraham Gesner, who was about to give a talk the next week when the femur arrived. He was really more interested in kerosene. And for three years, he traveled around in the, the Maritimes with Admiral Cochran aboard the HMS Wellesley. The NSIS has published a book review a couple years ago of uh, an excellent biography by Elizabeth Hay. And I really encourage you, don't need to read the review, just go write and get the book. It's an excellent uh, self-published book by, by uh, Elizabeth. So Abraham Gesner, inventor of kerosene, uh, doctor in Parsboro for a dozen years, mineralogist, Lyell. He took Lyell to Joggins. Gesner is extremely important. Um, but in 1849, 50, and 51, him and Cochrane were really interested in, in kerosene and petroleum. So they, they were good friends. And, and you can imagine this 75-gun ship that's just floating around Nova Scotia. And Gesner's on board. <coughs> so we haven't known a lot about their trips. But I was able to find uh, Admiral Cochrane, uh, Thomas Cochrane's notebook at Duke University, got a scan, and this page and several pages afterwards from the 1851 trip, that last trip, uh, has specimen numbers and uh, locations and rock types. So I took that and mapped the locations and show that they basically did this route serving around, but they then, they did stop in PEI and then came back to Halifax. So the report is, and we have had this, some pe previous people have suggested that 1850, there was a ship that came into the Bredore Lakes and they went to the Mastodon site. Now we know the route that the HMS Wellesley was taking on its surveying trips that they stopped in PEI. If in 1850, they did go into the Bredore and the sailors went aboard, 350 sailors aboard that ship, went up the Middle River and apparently found some bones and a skull and tusks and they brought it back down, but the canoe tipped over and some of it was lost, um, but some of it was on board the ship. Maybe the sailor, one of the sailors took one of the teeth and put it in his pocket, sailing around, came back into port in PEI, needs some rum, so he, Brings it, you know, there's the reverend. Oh, I'll take that. Here's maybe, maybe he's not going to give him around. Maybe he's going to give him a bottle or something. So that explains how this tooth from Bedeck would potentially arrive around that time. Still need to confirm that trip from 1850. There's this big void of records, but hoping that the British archives has something. So that's the early history of the Mastodons in Nova Scotia. Uh, first figured in 1868, and it would be another 60 years, but it would be at a meeting just like this. And Harry Pierce, then curator of the museum and really important person for Nova Scotia Institute of Science, stood up and read his paper on the Mastodon remains in Nova Scotia. And he did a really detailed analysis and talked to people that were still living that had, had given him information. Um, so um, I've taken his, Harry Pierce's excellent historical work. This is, it's difficult to look at. This is an old geology map. That's what geology maps used to look like. This is 
Fletcher's map 13 from 1884, but this is what Harry Pierce used to locate the, 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 the spot where it was reportedly found, the femur, and described as a mile west of the school. And so the school is marked on that map. So I took that map. This is 1864 lands and forests. You can see Donald McRae. So the family is still making sense. You know, you see all the plots of land. So this is my new research, taking and building on Harry Pierce. And today you can go to Geoscience Atlas online, just Google Nova Scotia Geoscience Atlas, and you can see the bedrock and surficial geology of an area. So that's what I'm doing here. In 2018, I went up thinking the mastodon is a glacial thing. So I'm thinking surficial geology. Um, and uh, also using the, the pits was able to find and meet and introduce myself to the property owners. So the landowners of that area now, uh, the property is Ian and Lisa Holt Jones. They're wonderful people that own the Tickle Trout Lodge. And Ian uh, graciously led me out the path to uh, basically, he's, he's now standing where the reported find was, now overgrown forest, but it used to be a hay field. And it's a beautiful area and it is all along that middle river is, is a, a restoration area of you know, Unamagi. So, um, you know, you can feel the importance. There's sinkholes around too. It's a really amazing place. Uh, but I didn't find any evidence of mastodons. But we went back three years later, and again, the Geoscience Atlas, but now more time thinking about it and thinking about the sinkholes and bedrock geology this time, and the blue. The blue is Windsor Group. The blue is gypsum or limestone. The star is located where it was found along Yankee Line Road. Now, what's also great is, uh, you can go to GeoNova and look at Elevation Explorer. So uh, Nova Scotia is really well endowed with LIDAR scans all over the province. Uh, so right from your desktop, you can look at the, the LIDAR. So that's laser, you know, airplane going over and using laser light to, to look through canopies and to look at the surface of the ground, get a really detailed view of the ground. You can also have really good view of satellite view. So there's, um, 10,000 foot aerial view, right? Showing that same area where the Massa was found. So if you're looking above, it just looks like a river valley and trees. When you look at the LIDAR, wow. there's a hidden island. So the, this whole thing is the river valley. The middle river has been moving back and forth since the glaciers left, basically carving down Oxbow's switching back, meandering this way for a while, and then all of a sudden there was a big storm and a bank burst, and now it's on this side. And so that hidden island, that elevation in the middle is basically the same as the sides. For whatever reason, the frequency of the river has always popped on one side or the other. It's been slowly carving away. You can see this is the area where in 2018 it had last been, and uh, when we were there, 2019, it was going straight down through. Look at those sinkholes. So that LIDAR is really important and, and shows now where that mastodon femur was found, was right in line, just down river from those sinkholes, modern sinkholes. But if there's modern sinkholes, there was ancient sinkholes. So I'm immediately starting to hunt for sinkholes, 80,000 year old sinkholes along this river. So working with colleagues, amazing Amy Tizard of Oxford sinkhole fame. We have the LIDAR in her handy dandy GPS thing there. She is an amazing field geologist. Uh, we walked all around the Hidden Island and Denise Bruchette also amazing. She's a surficial, the glacial geologist of the province and uh, also worked with Kathy Ogden, a colleague of mine at the museum. And uh, last year we collected uh, some materials. This is a drawing again, demonstrating that geologists, this is, this is right from Denise Bruchette's field book. 
a sketch of the outcrop. And you see down here, it says samples, two, three, four, stick, twigs, clay. So wood sampled, compressed branch, about in under about three or four, five meters of clay and sand. Uh, came back from C14 analysis as 80, over 50,000 years old. That's not a smoking gun. I don't know what it is. So that's our active area. We may have found the site um, that 190 years ago, this femur came down to Halifax. Was a, the tooth was exhibited, the exhibition figured by Dawson, described by Pierce. We may now. Basic, and because of all of them documenting and sharing the information, peers doing all that important work, we may now have found the site where that uh, femur was found by Big Sandy um, uh, almost 190 years ago. So Harry Pierce's work with the Nova Scotia Institute of Science was fundamentally important to everything we now know, what all the work that Bob Grantham and Kelly Kazera did, all of that is a direct descendant from Harry Pierce and the Nova Scotia Institute of Science. There was also in uh, 1950, Daniel Livingston published another NSIS paper on a tooth that was found uh, up on Magazine Hill while they were doing some construction up there. Some uh, gravel came in from uh, up uh, Milford Way, I'm just blanking on where it was. Uh, Anyway, it's, it's an isolated tooth, but reported by NSIS. Um, a little later in the 1960s, there was teeth starting to come up from scallop draggers and the museum acquired some of those and those have been written up. So this is uh, when the Grand Banks was exposed because the sea level was lower and uh, Grand Banks were above ground. There was mastodons and mammoths walking around. Um, so that's a really interesting part of the story. Then in 1989, uh, Alex Livingston, uh, sorry, Alex Wilson Wilcox uh, was working at uh, Bailey Gypsum Quarry and recovered a tusk. And Bob Grantham went down to collect it. And they uh, basically weren't able to find any more because it had already been sort of cleaned out. But it was only a couple years later that um, Bob Grantham got a phone call from the Milford Gypsum Quarry, the National Gypsum. Uh, he describes that he jumped with glee when he put the phone down and went and, um, and began their work. And that's 30 years ago and ties into the Asian Mastodon. So the NSIS has been here all the way along and played an extremely important part of the story of the Mastodons in Nova Scotia. And there's been a huge number of people that have been involved in, so from Bob Grantham, Kelly Kazera, Ralph Stay was the superficial geologist that worked with them to understand it, uh, Godfrey Smith, Dow doing the dating, but we also have modern researchers, uh, Scott Cocker and Amy Tizer, John Goss has now joined that crew up in Middle River to, to give us some more dates, Ruth Whitehead doing, suggesting the Mastan mud. Grant Zazula, Emil Karpinski, and Chris Wigda are modern collaborators. They're doing amazing things. Emil is now at uh, Yale or Harvard trying to clone a mammoth, I think is what he's doing. Um, Laura Eastman here at St. Mary's is doing isotope analysis of the teeth. Uh, grateful to Ian and Lisa Holt-Jones. Um, but also the resources that Nova Scotia has. The LIDAR project is extremely important. Um, and so all of these uh, people and <clears throat> groups collaborating in. So that's the story of the age of the Mastodon and drawing in science, the history of science, the history of the Nova Scotia Institute of Science. So please consider becoming a member because it's this society that has really um, uh, enabled us to make these types of leaps. And it's citizen science. It's, it's, these sorts of meetings and sharing information. Um, so let's see if we can get some new members tonight. And I'd be happy to talk uh, 